Welcome to the Corey Lee Show, where our focus is on building leaders and transforming culture. My name is Corey Lee, and in each episode, I aspire to ignite something on the inside of you that encourages you to grow yourself and to make an impact on the world around you. Welcome to the Corey Lee Show. Welcome back to the Corey Lee Show. Hey guys, got an exciting episode today that I am entitling. I'm entitling this episode an awakened generation. I think it is time to wake up. Did you know that we are responsible for our current generation? Like it is not an accident that you and I are here in 2024. And so it is our responsibility to take care of this uh, this generation and to take part and to equip this generation and the next. And so, hey, this podcast actually coming to you from on the road. We are on the road this week. We are in Nashville, Tennessee. Our kids are at a soccer um, soccer camp and uh, just uh, doing this one on the road. So let's jump in. I'm calling this an awakened generation. And y'all, this is actually something that has been stirring within me for really a while now, it's it's kind of this burning desire to take up the responsibility for the current generation and for the next, right? And to stand in the gap between heaven and earth and say, Lord, use me. I want to be your mouthpiece, your eyes. You know, I, I know your eyes go to and fro throughout the earth and you're looking for hearts that are fully committed to you. So, so you can, you know, Lord, that you can give your strong support to them. And, um, you know, would you look upon me? And, and because I want to be that for this generation, and I also want to inspire others to do the same. And that's the heart behind this podcast today is I hope it sparks something within you that says, I want to serve all of God's purposes in this generation. Acts 13, 36, it says that when David served God, all of God's will in his generation, he fell asleep. Man, that's good stuff. Like, so let's take up the will of God in our generation. Let's take up the responsibility. And I want to read to you something from Acts 17, um, Acts 17, 22 through 27. And Acts 17, 22 through, uh, yeah, right here, 22 uh, through um, Acts 17, 22. This is what it says. Paul, he is standing up. He's meeting at the Areopagus and he says, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship. And this is what I'm actually going to proclaim to you. The God who made the whole world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And here's the part that I really want to focus on today. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. Did you catch that? Did you see that? It said it said that God determined each person's pre-appointed time in history and the boundaries of their dwelling where they would live. Um, in Greek, there are actually two words for the word time, kind of like in English. We have, uh, when I say time, I could, you know, time is in the clock or we had a good time. In, in Greek, you have the word kairos, which is right time or the opportune moment. It refers to a moment or a season. The other word is chronos, which refers to a specific amount of time, like a, a day or, or an hour. So you got two words, kairos and chronos. So chronos would be, what time is it, Corey? What time is it? Well, it's 922 at the time of this recording. That would be chronos time. Kairos would be, you know, we had an awesome time at the Brotherhood Breakfast. We had an awesome time in, in Nashville as a family. It was a moment in time, the word used here in Acts 17 for time is kairos, kairos, opportune time. Let me tell you what that means for you and for me. That means God could have created you at any point in history. He could have created you a thousand years ago or a thousand years from now. But how about that? He created you at just the right time in the perfect time in history. We were created for such a time as this. It also says he determined the location where you would live. So unless you and I 
are being blatantly disobediently, uh, we're actually living in the exact place, the exact town or city that he wants us to be in. I don't know about you, but that's pretty amazing. You and I were created for such a time as this and for such a place as this. So now we got a few options, you know. With that awareness, we got a few options. Uh, since, since you and I are aware of this truth, now we can do something about it. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to God, but the things revealed belong to us and our children forever. See, the truths that have been revealed, I, I'm responsible for. I'm not responsible for the ones that are not revealed to me, right? And so we got some options. We can run and hide, and we wait this thing out. But I don't know about you, but everything that I see in Jesus and in his disciples, they did not disengage, but they actually engaged with culture. In fact, he walked his disciples 10 miles, it was about 10 -ish miles, to a place called Caesarea Philippi to ask them one question. Think about it. He, he walked his disciples 10 miles to ask them a question. Now, why in the world... It, it, when you read, there, there, there's no accounts of healing or miracles, although that may have happened, but there is nothing written that he walked to Caesarea Philippi and did any miracles or anything like that. He walked there, and what was what is recorded is a question that he asked. Now, Caesarea Philippi, this is a town, it was actually considered like a red light district of the world at that time. Uh, when the Greeks conquered it, they they named this town um, called Pan or Pan after their god. This is a half goat, half man looking god looking thing. And uh, it, it was their god that they served and they named this town Pan. Well, um, when the Romans came in and conquered it, they renamed it to Caesarea Philippi. But what was going on in Caesarea Philippi was the Romans says, you know what? We like that Greek goat looking God looking thing that you got going on there. We're going to continue to worship that, but we're also going to worship Caesar. And this was actually a place where they did a lot of their um, horrendous acts, their their sacrifices and all. But in, in Caesarea Philippi, it's at the base of this mountain and there's this opening at the base of the mountain. And this is where they would do all their sacrifices. Well, they called this a bottomless pit. And it was considered the gates to the underworld, the gates of hell. Well, Jesus walks his disciples to Caesarea Philippi and he asks them a question. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they say, well, you know, some people call you, some people say you're one of the prophets. Some people say uh, you're John the Baptist. Some people say, you know, you, you're just a... a, a an awesome person, right? Or whatever. And and Jesus then asked, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter chimes in and says, well, you are the Christ, the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus says, right, you are, Peter. Right, you are. And on this rock, on this revelation, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Jesus was standing in the physical location considered the gates of hell on earth and proclaimed that he was the Messiah, that he was the Christ, and that his church would overcome, that the gates of hell could not overcome. In fact, that his church would overcome the gates of hell. And so as I think about that, uh, there's a lot that we could say about that, but, but a couple of things is that um, he was standing in the, the physical place that was considered the gates of hell and the boldness to declare who he was and how he was going to overcome. But two, how important it is to have a personal revelation of who Jesus is. There's a lot of opinions. There's a lot of thoughts by other people. But having a personal revelation of who Jesus is is, is very important. And so I would ask you that question, who do you say that Jesus is? So one option that we have is we can run and hide. The other option we that I you know I can think of is that we can be apathetic or indifferent. But if if you're indifferent, you cannot make a difference if there's indifference in your heart. Another option we can just complain about it, right? We, we can say the world is just getting darker and darker. It's just getting worse and worse. Boy, this world is getting so dark, it's going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> you know we can just complain about all the problems going on in the world instead of asking Jesus for a solution. And, and so whenever I complain and I don't seek out a solution, what I'm doing is I'm laying down my responsibility to be the light of the world, to make 
and to be a disciple of all nations. If I think I'm ill-equipped for the problems going on, then in the back of my mind, I'm saying he's to blame because he put me here. Think about that. If if I'm just going to focus on the complaints, I'm laying down my responsibility to be the light of the world. Hey guys, I hope you are enjoying this episode of The Corey Lee Show. Y'all, I am on a mission to build leaders and to transform culture. So if you're looking for a speaker who speaks directly to the heart, a mentor to come alongside you and your team, or if you're in a position where you're looking for a personal coach who embraces where you are and also believes in who you could become, then I would be honored to walk this path with you. Simply reach out to me on my email at Corey at CoreyLeeLeadership.com. Look, let's make your vision a reality. Contact me and together we'll navigate the path from aspiration to achievement. Your transformation, it starts now. The other option is we can light this bird up, right? We can light it up. I want to read to you Isaiah 61 through 3. It says, arise and shine. Wherever you are, say arise and shine. There you go. Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the people. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Like there is a drawing there. I want to read to you Matthew 5. Here, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and to trample underfoot. Here it is. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. See, it says, let your light so shine before men that they glorify your Father in heaven. There is a way that you and I can carry ourselves. There's a way that we can go about doing our work and interacting with people. There's a way that we can go about our life that is so different from what people are used to seeing in the world that they say, man, there's something different about that dude right there. There's something different about that lady right there. And it causes them to give glory to God. Not to yourself, but glory to God. See, there is something attractive about the light that is in you. You know, in the natural world, light and darkness cannot coexist in the same place at the same time, unless the light is being blocked or if it's covered. In the room that I'm in, in the room that you're in right now, right? But in the room that I in, I'm in, if I turned off all the lights, it would get dark in here. But the very moment I flip the switch on, the darkness is expelled. The darkness has to flee. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and they give glory, not to you, but our Lord Jesus. Um, I, I want to share, there, I read a book not too long ago. It's called The New Kind of Diversity. Super fascinating book. Dude did this study, um, and he called it New Kind of Diversity. What he's talking about is there are currently five generations in the workplace. You have the youngest baby boomers, and you have the oldest Gen Z, all working in the same same place. Um, and he calls this the new kind of diversity, the diversity in the age groups. And in this book, he talks about, you know, the way these generations view society, the the way they view work, the way they view relationships, the way they view um, authority. And, and he breaks it down, how they got to this point, what forms their thoughts, all those kind of things. They have different views on ethics. They have different views on identity. But one thing that really stood out to me that I want to share with you is his breakdown of how they view authority. Now, I want you to think about authority. Authority is anyone in leadership. That's from uh, your mom and dad, your mom and them. That's authority in government. It's authority in um, leadership at work, leadership in, in the church, whatever. But their view on authority, and I just want to give you a breakdown of, of three generations. The Gen X or the baby busters, 
and uh, the millennials and then Gen Z. And so he says, Gen X, this is the ages that is between 40 and 58. And their view on authority is, well, I guess we will have to endure them. We just gonna have to put up with them, right? We just got to put up with them. And, and think about it. This was the generation that was first to really see multiple presidents lie from the Oval Office. They they saw the lies told by them in in leadership with Vietnam. This age group, they saw the business world was untrusty. You think about Enron, and because mass television or mass communication, like um, newspapers, uh, TV, that that was mass produced, and where you could get news around the globe, you even saw some of the moral failures within the church, and so they began to lose trust in leadership. And so, well, you know what, I guess we'll just have to put up with these people. We'll just have to endure the leadership that we have. Well, the next generation comes along, and that's the millennial generation. That's the ages 23 through 39. And their view on authority as well, I guess, you know, we'll just choose them. We'll just choose them. Think about it. It goes from endure them to choose them. I don't know if you've heard the phrase, now my president, <laughs> you know, they said it with President Obama, it was said with President Trump, and now it's said with President, um, with Biden. But their thought here is, you may be my school teacher, but you're not my mentor. You may be the guy who preaches on Sunday, but you're not my pastor. See, this generation says, I hear what you're saying, but I don't see the fruit in your own life. So I hear you, but there are spaces in my heart that I have guarded and you have, I'm not giving you access to that part of me. This gener generation, the phrase of do as I say, not as I do, does not fly with them. In leadership, we, we teach, when I do leadership training with companies or one-on-one or -on -one with um, individuals, something that I have learned and one of the things we teach is that leadership is both taught and caught. The taught part, that is information. Anybody can go read a book and regurgitate information, but it's the caught part that transforms lives. The caught part is when someone is teaching something from life experience with the information. It is contagious. And you can tell when you're around somebody who has experience with the information that they are teaching. And so this generation where they say is we will choose them, what they're looking for is they're looking for someone with integrity. They're looking for someone who uh, whose actions and words are in alignment with one another. And so they're very guarded with who has access to the deeper parts of their heart. Well, that's the millennials. The Gen Z comes along and that's ages eight to 22 and their view on authority. All right. Think about it. It goes from we'll have to endure them to we choose them. Well, this generation, their view on, on authority. Think about this. Leadership is I'm not sure if I need you. What do I need you for? Right. Think about it. millennials grew up with the cell phone. Well, this is the first generation to grow up with a smartphone. Right at the tip of their thumb, they have access to any information they want, basically. More information at the tip of their thumb than the president did 30 or 40 years ago. See, they, they can easily go to Siri or Alexa or Google and they can find the answer to any question they may they may have. So the thought is, you know, I can go to YouTube for any sermon I want. I can go listen to a podcast to learn any leadership principle I want. If I need to learn how to do something, I can just go watch a YouTube for that. What do I need you for? Right? And so they are flooded with information. And this has actually led to this generation having the highest levels of anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts. What they need is a father and a mother in their life. They need spiritual fathers and mothers in their life who can help give them context to the information they are receiving. But we but we got to do the hard work of connecting with them and having fruit in our own lives. They are looking for people who are genuine and authentic. I, I think the worst thing we can do for this younger generation is say is to say, well, the, these kids nowadays, they're just a bunch of snowflakes and have no respect for other people. My generation is the last great generation. I feel bad that my grandkids or my kids or my great grandkids will grow up in this kind of culture. 
No, come on, man. That's not the way to think. Let's take up the responsibility to be the light and to offer the light of the world into a dark world. You know, um, when you think about dark, sometimes we think about evil and sometimes it, it does refer to evil, but darkness refers to lack of knowledge. Right. And so so the generation that that is rising up, they need to be educated, but to be educated and, and to have that one on one connection, we've got to do the heart work of connecting with them first and having the fruit of it in our own lives. The phrase do as I say, not as I do, no longer applies. You cannot say that ever again. All right. I think also the, the worst thing the younger generation can do is say, well, these old folks are just a bunch of fuddy duddies who are out of touch with reality. And the, and and so I think we need each other. Yeah, you know, I know the word says that in the last days, violence will increase. People will become lovers of themselves and the love of many will grow cold. But let me tell you something that does not have to be true for you. It does not have to be true for your family or for the world that you are called to. So I want to encourage you to take up the responsibility for redeeming the time that we've been given and to take up responsibility for the territory that you, my friend, have been assigned to. And so, hey, I hope today has encouraged you. I hope it has inspired you to do something. I hope it has is, is sparked something on the inside of you to say, you know what? What can I do? Whenever I start start to complain about the things that I see, Instead of complaining, maybe my first thing is to turn to, hey, what's the solution? And so let the complainers complain, let the moaners moan, let the whiners whine, but that ain't for you. You are a champion. You are made for such a time as this. You are a world changer. You're a history maker. And so, hey, I appreciate you. Hope this uh, has encouraged you. If you want to, uh, I would love to hear back from you. I would love to hear maybe what stood out to you. Would love to hear uh, questions that you have or some thoughts that you're thinking into. And so, uh, please feel free to send a uh, email to me, Corey at CoreyLeadership.com, or comment on this video, comment on this podcast. Also, feel free to share it with a friend or family member. And so make sure you like and subscribe so you can stay up to date with any of the latest episodes of The Corey Lee Show. Hope you guys have a great day and God bless. Three, two, one. Okay. Thanks for joining me today. I hope I have added value to you. And if you have found value in this episode, let me know. Drop a comment and make sure you share with a friend or family member. See you next episode.